Well, good afternoon and welcome to H360 Live. My name is Dave Duplay and I'm joined here in the studio this afternoon by my friend and colleague, my partner, Cortland Long from Healthy O360. Cortland, it's great to see you. Good to be here. Well, we had an exciting weekend this past weekend. We had four walks, three mm -hmm. on Saturday, one on Sunday. And, you know, the weather held out. It really cooperated. Saturday was absolutely gorgeous. Sunday, a little bit windy here in the Big Apple. But you know what? The walkers were out in full force raising money for some good health causes. It was a really busy weekend, but it's always so fun to be out in the community and seeing all the people that we try to help support. Absolutely. Well, Cortland, I'm really excited about today. Yes. I am because we have Laura <laughs> Friedman coming into the studio from the uh, Hearing Health Foundation and she is the communication and program manager there. They are really doing some great work. They're funding research. They've got some programs we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking to Laura about her journey with hearing loss as well. Really exciting. She is so inspirational and she's doing such good work over at the foundation. I just can't wait to get her in. But Cortland, first, we always have some health tips and in line with what we're going to be talking to Laura about today, we've got some health tips pertaining to the ear. Yes. And these are really, really important health tips. So I want you to pay attention here because they're going to help you out and protect your ears. So Cortland, why don't you kick us off and give us the first health tip? I would love to. Well, tip number one is say no to Q-tips. Now I know it can be a little bit gross to talk about earwax, but it actually plays a very important role in protecting your ear. And you wanna make sure that you're never putting anything down into your ear canal as that can lead to quite a bit of damage. So when the ear, can, when the ear wax migrates to the outside of the ear canal, you can simply wash it off with a washcloth and you know every package of cotton swabs actually says not to put it into the ear canal. Um, when you're sticking a Q-tip in, into the ear, it can actually push the wax further into the ear, compacting it into the canal, and you'll have to see your doctor to have it removed. Yeah, you really want to be careful. And your point is a good one. On every package, there's that warning label that talks about the proper use of a Q-tip or a cotton swab. So mm -hmm. great health point there, Cortland. The second one is beware of swimmer's ear. Now, we're coming upon the summer months, people are gonna be out in the pool, we're gonna be jumping in the pond or the lake, we're gonna be water skiing, we're gonna be in the hot tubs. You gotta watch the swimmer's ear. Now you get a little water in the ear and you can't seem to get it out and you kind of notice something's going on there. You know, when I was a kid, I used to hop around on one foot and shake my head to try to get the water out. <laughs> sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Now, here's the thing. You gotta really be careful because if you notice that that water is not coming out, you know, the first stop is probably a trip to the pharmacy and see what they have over the counter that you can put the drops in your ear and evaporate that water. Now, if it persists for a day or two, you wanna go see your doctor because here's the danger, that could turn into an ear infection and lead to bad things, especially, mm -hmm. you know, if you're in a pond or you're in a lake and there's algae in there and it's not the cleanest water, you really have to be careful about that swimmer's ear. Swimmer's ear and ear infections can be extraordinarily painful. My brother, every summer without fail, would get an ear infection. Poor kid, I, every photo of us as children, he's got cotton. Uh, oh, in boy. His ear. oh boy, oh <laughs> boy. Now did he yeah. have the tubes? He Is did it? have tubes, yeah. 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 Well, tip number three is plain proof your ears. Now, if you're traveling via an airplane, you really want to try to equalize the pressure in your ear. Not doing so can lead to um, some pretty serious problems, such as severe pain, bleeding, and even perforation of your eardrum. So to try to equalize the pressure, you want to yawn or chew on things, preferably not gum. Um, and if you're traveling with children, Crying actually can be a little bit of a good thing for children to help move around that pressure as well. If they're very young, you can give them pacifiers to help move the pressure, but again, try to stay away from the gum. Yeah, it can be a good thing, the crying for the children, not so much maybe <laughs> for the passengers sitting next to them. Yeah. I've gotten caught in the middle seat, you know, with a couple of kids beside me and young young children crying. Oh, I'm but, sure you had them laughing. Well, maybe, I'm, I'm not sure about that. But you know, you can always tell the experienced traveling families because the parent always waits for the plane to take off and then gives the bottle to the young child, mm -hmm. right? And that sucking on that bottle is helping, you know, equalize the ear. So yep. great tip. You always can point out the experienced travelers yes, with that. Yes, you can. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, Cortland, three great health tips. Let's review one at a time. The first one again. Say no to Q-tips. Say no to Q-tips. The second one. 
Beware of swimmer's ear. That swimmer's ear is going to get you. Remember, don't let that wait too long. Go see your medical professional. You don't want that to turn into an ear infection. Last but not least. Plain proof those ears. Plain proof the ears. Absolutely. Three great tips for Portland. We sent the interns, as we do every week, out into the fields at Bryant Park to see what our friendly New Yorkers know about earwax, ear hygiene, planning of the ears, and we threw in a couple of fun questions just to make you smile for today. So, Cortland, you want to watch the video? I would love to. Okay, guys, please roll it for me. How important is earwax and why? Um, you, you need earwax and you shouldn't just try and clean it out yourself. Uh -huh. It's actually there for part of your hearing. It helps with your hearing and it actually your, your ears actually clean themselves. I would say earwax is important because it can help block, you know, the outside things from getting inside of your ears. Yeah. But I think it like helps protect the ear, like yeah. sound from going in the ear. Exactly. It protects your ear? Yeah. I'm guessing. No, it does. And my grandmother would use it for things like uh, to prevent cold sores or to treat cold sores. I didn't know that. Old school stuff. Do you know what are some dangers of using Q-tips? Um, you can puncture your eardrum. Because people use Q-tips and poke it, poke uh -huh. it even more. Yeah, And exactly. actually can actually damage the eardrum. Exactly. And you can also poke the earwax yeah. further down, which doesn't help. You can hurt your eardrum if you dig in there too yeah. far. Yeah, exactly. Um, although that's how my mother taught us to use ear, ear Q-tips, and then later it was like, oh, that's all wrong. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sometimes you can push too hard, and uh -huh. it'll like push the earwax inside, rather yeah. than kind of like taking it out, which is like the purpose of using Q-tips is to kind of take it out. Yeah. Sometimes you can like push too deep and like damage your ear. Exactly. Do you know what swimmer's ear is and how it's developed? I've had swimmer's ear several oh, times, because wow. I used to do a lot of swimming sea and in the swimming pool. I don't know how it's developed. I used to think it was because of water in uh -huh. my ear and it affected the balance. Yeah. So my ears used to get quite badly infected. Um, I guess it's developed by swimmers. I guess from like swimming. <laughs> I don't know if you like water too much in your ear or something, you get okay. kind of an infection. Yeah. When water goes into your ear, mm -hmm. um, then it can like create bacteria, I think. Yeah. Um, I know that obviously when you go swimming, water can get trapped in your ear. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure how it's developed, but. Uh, you can get like an ear infection yeah. from it. So what are some ways from preventing popping when you're on an airplane? Um, I prevent it by, I try to yawn a lot okay. on the airplane. Okay. You can prevent your ears from popping by, um, they always say chew gum, yeah, exactly. or you like hold your nose and like blow yeah. when you feel <laughs> congestion coming. Yeah. Um, yawning helps and uh -huh. chewing gum, yeah. that's what I use. Um, sucking on a sweet. <laughs> Apparently, because I know at the end of a, a flight we're often given sweets to suck on. Yeah. Um, I don't think you're supposed to do this, but I do sometimes hold my nose and, and yeah, and I that pops it. And I don't think you're supposed to do that. <laughs> Portland, what do you think? We had some really great responses to those questions and one woman unfortunately did get quite a few ear infections um, when she was a kid so that's really painful. Yeah absolutely it seems like the folks were well educated mm -hmm. on you know the whole use of the uh, q-tip yes and the importance of earwax what it's meant that you know to be there for and how it protects the ear they really were and they had some good tips on how to equalize the pressure in your ears when you are flying i know some of our teammates here find those tips to be a little humorous yeah the sweet sucking on the sweet yeah. right mm -hmm. very british uh, term there i yeah. think yeah, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was very good yeah. well they did a great job our interns did a fabulous job. Our friendly New Yorkers, as always, were very opinionated, but really knew a lot about the air. And yeah. I was very surprised about that. Yeah. It was a great video. Well, Cortland, our favorite time of the show, Laura's in the studio. But, you know, we've got so much to talk to her about. But before we get started, I want to give a little basic information uh, about hearing loss. So here we go. 48 million Americans have hearing loss. That, to me, was an, a, a very big number. I was surprised by that. Over 90% of children with hearing loss are born with hearing parents. We're going to talk to Laura about that. She knows something about it. Uh, a mild hearing loss can cause a child to miss as up to up to as much as 50% of classroom discussion. So, you know, early detection, early diagnosis, very important in children. Um, with early identification and appropriate services, children 
uh, with hearing loss can develop communication skills at the same rate as their hearing peers. That's great to know. And noise is one of the leading causes of hearing loss. Probably not a big surprise to many of you there. So, Laura, it's great to have you here. Thank you for having me. It's so good to see you, and we've got so many things we want to talk to you about because the work that your organization is doing is just really phenomenal. The Hearing Health Foundation, which, by the way, for those of you at home, can be found at hhf.org. A lot of great information and services there. So, Cortland, let's get the interview started. All right. Well, Laura, again, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to have you here during uh, May as it is Better Hearing and Speech Month. So we're excited to be speaking with you today. I'm excited as well. Yeah. Can we start off with you telling us a little bit about your history growing up and when you learned that you were living with hearing loss? Yeah. So I was diagnosed at about three and a half. Um, prior to that, for about a year and a half, my parents took me to various specialists to get to figure out why I wasn't responding to words and why I wasn't speaking at the same time that typically kids start speaking to their parents. Um, one thing they did notice, which didn't ring a bell right away, was that if my mom was speaking to me, facing me, as most parents do when they have babies, I responded. But if I was faced away, there was no response whatsoever, which should have been the first clue of my hearing loss. But there's as many of you know, not a lot of information about an awareness around the different signs of hearing loss. Mm -hmm. um, so about three and a half after a year of speech therapy um, and really no improvement whatsoever, my mom was, decided to take me to the school district after some advice she had received. She was a little hesitant um, back then and even today the school district tends to label students based off of their limited abilities and segment them because of it um, and she didn't want to in my growth. Um, she, she somehow knew I was the bright child she always wanted. Um, so after about 10 minutes, uh, the school district said, your daughter has moderate to profound hearing loss. She needs to get hearing aids. She, needs, you know, she might never speak. You know, they didn't really understand the degrees. Um, but within 10 minutes, everyone else that they have taken me to agreed with the diagnosis. And from then on out, I mean, my mom was a champion. Uh, she just made so that I would catch up to everyone else and surpass them and that I was as capable as any one of my typical hearing family members. Now, Laura, my antenna went up when you said something because I don't like to label people. and We deal with all kinds of people here with all kinds of conditions. And you said the, the school district tends to maybe label people or put them in a bucket. Can you explain a little bit more about what you mean there? Yes, and it's not, um, I, I want to clarify, I'm not blaming the school district for their practices. Um, I don't know enough about the educational system to have a full opinion on it. But I, generally, a society does stigmatize, um, not just people with hearing loss, but people with all sorts of ranges of abilities, um, or as people like to identify them as people with disabilities. Um, but they, just because they might have lim limited mobility, limited ability to hear, see, so forth, doesn't make them any less able to accomplish their goals than anyone else who has their full abilities. Um, and the school district definitely, the educational system definitely tends to label children and then decide what's best for them based off of that label rather than necessarily their individual needs. Um, that takes a lot of effort and that's not to say they don't have the ability to do so, but that is, had been the general assessment of my experience. Yeah, and what about socially from your peers as a child? Yeah, um, you know, most of my friends are my friends because they understand my limitations with hearing, they know how to accommodate my needs, but there's definitely been instances where I've gotten some very strange questions, abrupt, aggressive, um, and people are definitely bullies sometimes. Um, to try and I try and do my best to be oblivious to it and just walk it off. Um, sometimes it does sting quite a bit. Uh, and I definitely encountered it in a more institutional level as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So having lived through these experiences and being an adult now and able to process everything, uh, if you could give one piece of advice to a child living with hearing loss, what would that be? I'd have to say keep on going, persevere. Um, you know, I think this goes for everyone. You know, everyone has a time in their life where they have challenges, difficulties, they get a little bit down on themselves, questioning why something's happening to them, why, why me? 
Mm -hmm. um, it's really the next step towards your goal, towards the, the desired outcome that defines you. And it's no different for someone with hearing loss. It just might take them a little bit more effort to overcome those obstacles. Just keep going at it. Keep changing the minds and the perceptions of those around you. Because before you know it, that one person becomes 20 people, becomes 50 people, and you don't know who they know and you don't know what influence they might have. And then, yeah, and what about um, hearing parents raising a child with hearing loss? You know, what, what advice can you give there? Yeah, I can just say from my personal experience with my parents, um, they never treated me any differently than my fu fully hearing brother. Um, he himself is extremely bright and smart, and I, he pushed me to work harder and vice versa with each other's success stories. Um, they, they just, they never knew what to expect of me, but they didn't expect any less. And that might seem somewhat contradictory, but you know, you might be surprised with how smart and how observant and the different skill sets that you develop as someone with hearing loss versus someone who gets everything without looking at someone in the eye. Mm -hmm. yep. so. so Laura, can hearing loss be prevented and if you do develop it, can you come back from it? Very good question. Um, hearing loss for people who have full hearing as well as people living with hearing loss um, can be prevented. So, and what I mean by that is, if you have hearing loss, you can protect the hearing that you have left, the residual hearing, um, and prevent further damage. Uh, hearing tend, as you age and expose it to noise, the subway, lawnmowers, hair dryers, you name it, everything has noise. This very quiet studio is not without noise, um, even with everyone, all of us not speaking. And we, Noise is defined by the sound that our, our brain can detect, not by the sound that we hear. And just because we become tolerant of certain levels of noise doesn't mean that it's not damaging. Um, it's somewhat like how people talk about skin and skin cancer. There's no rhyme or reason when you develop skin cancer, but overexposure to the sun can definitely increase your risk. Overexposure to noise can definitely increase your risk. Mm -hmm. um, so I hope that answers the question. Yep. You know, now we hit on some really important topics here. Mm -hmm. um, but what about some of the myths around hearing loss? So, you know, what myths do we want to dispel? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think the first one is let's dispel the notion that people with hearing loss are any less intelligent than people with full hearing. Um, we tend to think of people who wear glasses, like the two of you, <laughs> as smarter and brighter and maybe geeks. You know, but that tends to be in the more complimentary side. People with hearing loss, you know, if they miss something conversation, they say, let's say they say what or um a lot, and they're not quite sure, and they seem to be struggling, they tend to be written off as less intelligent, old. Um, you can develop hearing loss at any age. It does not discriminate any age, any race, any gender, any ethnicity. Um, we're all at the same risk. Men do have a higher risk. They tend to be used more noise in their daily life, whether it's occupational hazards um, or shooting guns, you know, as a hobby. There are studies that show men are at higher risk, but in actuality, we're all at the, you know, we're all at risk. Mm -hmm. um, and we just need to be really cautious of whether or not we have the hairdryer on while we're talking on the phone with the music blasting in the other room and the kid crying and playing with the toys mm -hmm. um, that have the loud music. Yeah, you know, unfortunately, you're right. I mean, guys do some pretty crazy things, like <laughs> maybe out shooting trap or skeet without the appropriate ear protection. Or so this a story you need to tell us? Or, or letting fireworks <laughs> off. It. Well, I, I, after years of therapy, I'm over that. So let's uh -huh. move along. Well, Laura, we know that you were a very ambitious um, child and teenager. And in fact, when you were in high school, you developed a website called Here's Help, and that's spelled H-E-A-R-S as in hearing, and it was, this was meant to be a support network for children and adults living with hearing loss. Yeah, um, wow, this is just a long time ago. It was <laughs> pre-Facebook, if you believe it or not. Um, so yeah, it, I really wanted to, to even go back further. Um, when I was younger, I always enjoyed helping others. It didn't mean just people with hearing loss. It, I volunteered with a group of disabled elderly. Um, they came into my synagogue once a month and you know, most people did it to beef up their resume. That was the initial purpose. 
I fell in love. Mm -hmm. I cried on my last day. I mean, it was, I just, I don't know, something about who I am as a person really is about giving back to the community. Um, and I also never really had any hearing loss friends growing up. It wasn't until I was 18 that I met three people my age with hearing loss. I also never sought them out. However, I didn't know of any avenues if I wanted to seek advice for me to do so, and I wanted to provide that avenue should someone want it. Um, one thing I did learn is that it's very hard back in the day to promote your website without the use of social media. <laughs> so without, it didn't, the word got out by word of mouth and I wrote an article about it, but I was also a little young to know other means um, and I didn't have money to pay for advertising. So it did not necessarily become the big Curious Help that I had hoped, but it's all a learning experience. And then the other thing I learned from it is that mothers in particular are very concerned about the well-being of their child, more so than the child themselves. And that's something I, it's even true for me today. I accept that my hearing loss is what it is. I need hearing aids, this is, this is it, this is, this is my life, I move on. My mother is so diligent, as other mothers I've, I've learned, in finding what the next best thing. Mm -hmm. And they would reach out to me, mothers would ask, how do I get my kid better services? What services do I ask for? Um, they're trying to tell me this, and this, I, I don't really, my gut tells me otherwise. And I expanded it and I made, they all emailed me confidentially at help at yahoo.com. It's now defunct. <laughs> but I created a Here's Health Mom email address, and my mom got ex inbox exploded 10 times as much as I did. It was really, now looking back, eye opening. I mean, clearly caregivers want the best for the people they care for. They feel responsible. They feel like it's their duty, their mm -hmm. citizen, um, to make sure that they do what, the best that they can do. And that makes a whole lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Now, a couple more things you said that really sparked my interest about the hair dryer and the talking on the phone. So, you know, children, it seems like at an earlier age, are equipped with cell phones or mm -hmm. smartphones now. Um, a child with hearing loss, does that present a problem for them talking on, on a cell phone? I, that's part A to the question. Part B, I'm, I'm curious to know about the earbuds because some of these earbuds are very powerful and loud and I, I would imagine very dangerous. Yeah, I definitely want to touch on number two a lot more. Um, but number one, uh, most, most people, not all, who have hearing aids and cochlear implants, there's a setting that's called T-coil. And what that means is that I switch to that setting and I put the phone to my ear, it takes all the noise from the phone and feeds it straight into my hearing aid. It's not like, it's not quite like Bluetooth, but I will use that analogy for those who are just huh. less informed about T-coil. The great thing about the T-coil technology is that rooms, just like a Broadway show, ha can be looped, which means the wire is installed, and you can tune in and the, mic the sound from the microphone goes directly in your ears. Um, the one thing about hearing aids, and I, I, I can't say personally, but cochlear implants, is that while they're a great solution, they're an imperfect solution. So they amplify all the noise around you. So I remember one time my hearing aids were misset, um, and I heard the refrigerator and the AC unit, and the dog in the room next door, and the, knock, the person knocking the, the apartment next to me, and I was overwhelmed with the amount of sound that I wouldn't even want to hear but that were being amplified. And so even, especially when you have hearing loss, you have to then narrow in on the voices that you want to listen to or the sounds that you want to listen to. Um, and so it's very, so yes, it can be difficult to hear on the phone. There's also option, um, this, most states provide options for caption phones. Um, mm -hmm. There's a bit of a delay. I personally don't use one. I can't give you um, any information based off my experiences, but they have worked for a lot of people, especially if they're older and their hearing loss has progressed over age, um, or they have much more profound hearing loss than I do. Um, on the earbuds, I'm so glad you brought that up. It's such a huge issue. Um, when the mu earbuds are not designed, at least to the best of my knowledge, to block out the noise around you. So you're getting a lot more sound than you're actually hearing, but your ears are getting damaged at the level of sound that's actually coming in. Hmm. And what I mean by that is your cell phones, your iPhones and iPads and 
iPods and Androids can go up to, I want to say, 110 decibels, which is a, da much, a very damaging level. Um, I, I couldn't even go higher than that. And the safe listening level is about 85 decibels. Um, and it's, it, the way decibels work are a little bit complicated, but that's a, that's a, big, that's a big jump. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you put your, your volume up all the way, you're doing a lot of damage to the ear, even though you're not necessarily hearing the bass of the, and the drums and the guitar the way you want to. Um, and so it's really important to be mindful, keep the volume to halfway, maybe invest in getting the big over-the-head earphones with noise canceling. That way you can listen the way you want to, but at a less damaging level. Yeah, good point. That is a really good point. I think about that all the time when I can hear someone five seats down in the subway and they've got the earbuds in. Yeah, just know that they're damaging their ears when you hear it. When you can yeah. hear the music that far away, even the person next to you, yeah. um, maybe, maybe we all should do a duty and tap them in the soda and be like, hey, I, th I, I just think you should turn it down a little bit. Yeah. You don't have to get into the ear stuff, but maybe you'd be doing a duty to society to educate. Um, but we're very big advocates mm -hmm. on, you know, lowering, the, lowering and decreasing the volume. It yeah. doesn't mean it's less fun, it's just maybe a little bit safer for all yeah. of us. Yeah, right. good point. Well, Laura, being in the limelight, you are no stranger to that. In 2014, your audiologist, Dr. Medell, mm -hmm. am I saying that correctly? Um, yes, Medell. He asked you to be in a documentary that he was producing. Can you tell us about that? Yes. Um, I'm really, I was really excited to be part of this documentary. It's not out yet, it's, um, but it basically interviews, I want to say, about 18 of her ex-patients. Uh, we were called her kids. Um, she was a pediatric audiologist. I grew up with her as my doctor. Um, and she interviewed us on our lives at, at that current moment and how with hearing loss and how it might have affected our work, our college education. All of us were about in our 20s and 30s, I want to say. So we we have a graduated childhood and moved on to adulthood. And she's also retired at this point. So it was a little bit of an update. It was more to spread awareness about hearing loss. And I want to see more of the capabilities of people with hearing loss, but also the way society has continually put us down and how many obstacles we have to overcome. So we talked about subjects like dating and disclose and when to disclose you have hearing loss, especially in the modern day world of online dating. Do you put in your profile? Do you tell them over text before you meet? Do you tell them at dinner on the first date? Um, all valid reasons why you should do all of those and none of those, um, but it's not without stress on the person who has to disclose. Um, when to tell your employer during an interview how your employer accommodated your needs. Even if they accommodated your needs, you know, what other issues have evolved um, that are different than when you're in school? Uh, it's, and even getting accommodations in college can be difficult. Mm -hmm. and, and exams and a note taker and so forth. What, what you suggest others in your shoes. It's kind yeah. of like what I'm doing here today. Yeah. Right. Well, all good points. And for those of you at home, you know, we're not going to have time to get to the answers of all of those and how you're handling disclosure and online dating and working with your employer and your work colleagues. However, Hearing Health Foundation has an excellent website, hhf.org. I would encourage you to go there, check it out. Well, um, Lord, to wrap things up here, um, the foundation, tell us about because we, we talked a lot about you and, and that's important and very inspirational, but the work that you're doing at the foundation is really incredible. Can you share with our audience, you know, what's the mission and the vision of the foundation? Yes, now Hearing Health Foundation is an amazing organization. It's been around since 1958. Uh, our mission is to prevent and cure hearing loss and tinnitus, which is otherwise known as ringing in the ear, through groundbreaking research and to promote hearing health. Um, we have two major research programs in which we provide grant funding to scientists who are researching different areas of hearing loss um, and different hearing conditions, such as hearing loss tinnitus, Meniere's disease, which can, it's very similar, but a little bit different than vertigo, with an inner ear disorder that causes dizziness, um, nausea, you know, migraines. Um, it's very debilitating. People with CAPD, which is central auditory processing disorder, 
Um, many children who are diagnosed with learning disabilities actually have an auditory processing disability, um, and we're learning out ways to understand that mechanism to overcome that. Uh, and among other different research areas, and we're also researching specifically through a consortium of 14 senior scientists, ways better therapies for hearing loss, and also ultimately a cure for certain types of hearing loss through hair cell regeneration. So our ears, our inner ears are, uh, have a cochlear, um, and within that cochlear there's hair cells. And those hair cells transmit sound on a very basic level, transmit sound to the brain, and those those sound, those waves, those to the brain waves, um, being are interpreted into the sounds that we hear. And now, when you have damage to certain hair cells, they might be inactive or not working properly. Some people have no hair cells whatsoever; they have genetic disorders that wipe them out. Um, but we're looking at ways to regenerate those hair cells into perfectly healthy, full hearing hair cells to restore hearing. Um, they're doing great work. Uh, they're in about their fifth year being a consortium. Uh, it's, it's been quite a ride, and um, we're showing a lot of progress. Mm -hmm. Oh, fantastic. Well, I'm going to give my partner here the opportunity to ask the last question. Well, you guys are doing, you are funding some really amazing research, and so we want to make sure that our members can find out more information about Hearing Health Foundation. I know that Dave has provided the URL a couple times, but can you also let our members know how they can contribute to the mission of Hearing Health Foundation? Yeah, um, right on our website, hhf.org, on the, I want to say the right hand top corner, there's a little donate pink symbol. Click on that and it will take you to a form to contribute online. If you know, many people are afraid of website security. Our website definitely secure. We invest a lot of money in that. But if you want to write us a check, our um, address is at the bottom of hhf.org, and we'll be happy to process a hard written check. Okay, absolutely. Well, Laura, thanks so much for coming in, and on behalf of HealthyO 360 and all of our members, we want to thank you and your organization for the good work, so keep that up. I'd like to thank our viewers for tuning in this afternoon, and I'd like to thank our sponsors for making this all possible. Remember, all of our episodes can be viewed on demand at HealthyO360.com, and our podcast can be found in the iTunes store. Well, we love social media, and we're all over Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest. We use the hashtag Real Stories when posting, and we'd greatly appreciate it if you would do the same. On behalf of Dave Duplay, myself, and the entire Healthy O360 family, we'd like to thank you again for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you again next week when we're chatting with Veronica Trathan of the Family Resource Network.